So just very quickly before I jump into my topic, before I pray, uh, just a couple of things about uh, a couple of books I've written that have sections on the Holy Spirit and counseling and especially on inner healing prayer. I've developed a model for inner healing prayer that has seven st steps, you know, fully dependent on the Holy Spirit's guidance. So the first one is an earlier book uh, that I wrote with John Ortberg called Coping with Depression, the second edition. And uh, from pages 64 to 71, there's a whole section on inner healing prayer there and how you can ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to pray for inner healing of painful memories, either in your own life or in the life of someone else you're helping or counseling. But this book is more than just inner healing prayer. There's only one intervention. There are quite a number of different interventions, mainly from a cognitive behavioral perspective that can help you cope better with depression. And depression is one of the most common disorders today, and particularly in the context of the pandemic, both in the States and here in Singapore and elsewhere. Okay? The, the occurrence or prevalence of disorders like depression and anxiety have gone up actually at least 25 to 30 percent. That's a lot more. Okay? So we need to really rise up to help people, including lay counselors who can help. And then I wrote a book a, a couple of years ago, 2019, just before the pandemic was out, called Shepherding God's People. It's a textbook on pastoral ministry, a guide to faithful and fruitful pastoral ministry for pastors and church leaders. Hmm? And in this, chap in this book, I have a chapter on, uh, chapter two is on the Holy Spirit, the importance and crucial, uh, essential role of the Holy Spirit in pastoral ministry. And then I cover about 10 different areas of pastoral ministry, all the way from preaching, teaching, to small groups, to discipleship, to leadership, to mentoring, to conducting funerals and weddings, to church boards and budgets and buildings, okay, and to uh, 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 evangelism, social concern, all the things that a pastor is involved in or a church leader is involved in, but in the power and presence of the Spirit by God's grace. Okay, so this is shepherding God's people. And then finally, those of you who are really interested in counseling and going to deeper uh, uh, levels of understanding. This is a textbook that's now used all over the world in uh, Christian counseling schools, including here in Singapore and the States. It's called Counseling and Psychotherapy, uh, Christian Perspective. It's a second edition. It just came out two weeks ago, and uh, it's very heavy. It, it, is, it weighs five pounds, and it's $50 US. <laughs> so um, uh, there are about 600 pages. Somebody actually counted and looked at my book and said, you have 100 pages of references, Yang Yang, and about over 1,000 references. It took quite a while to write this book. It was during the pandemic where there was lockdown. I wrote for 10 to 12 hours every day for several months, pulled it all together, and the book is now out. So if you want the latest edition of Counseling and Psychotherapy, A Christian Perspective, second edition, this is it, Big Academic, okay? So just for your information. And this book has a section, the last part of the book, on... Um, a Christian approach to counseling and psychotherapy that is Christ-centered, Bible-based, and Spirit-filled. And one of the chapters is on the Holy Spirit and spirituality in counseling. So much of what I'm going to say is in this book, in this chapter on the Holy Spirit and counseling toward the end of the book. The rest of the book covers about 10 to 15 to 20 major schools of psychotherapy, some more, some less, some have whole chapters, okay? And a biblical critique, the latest research evidence for or against it, their efficacy or effectiveness, and, uh, and, um, and also uh, the uh, uh, overview of some of the schools of counseling, the techniques. All right, enough said about that. Today, uh, Georgie invited me to come and speak. Tomorrow at the church, uh, Chapel of the Holy Spirit, the Ang Anglican Church has invited me to preach at 11 o'clock on the Holy Spirit and mental health. Okay? Today, you have the same topic, the Holy Spirit and mental health, but actually, the original topic was the Holy Spirit in counseling and psychotherapy and deliverance ministries. Okay? How does the Holy Spirit uh, uh, help us in these areas? And the Holy Spirit is essential and crucial in every area of ministry, not just counseling, psychotherapy, and deliverance, in preaching, teaching, small groups, every area of our, our ministry. Huh? And the Holy Spirit is essential in our Christian life, not just ministry. It's the Holy Spirit who converts us, not ourselves, to Jesus Christ, right? And it's the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, who makes us more like Jesus. No? And we, today we talk a lot about the spiritual disciplines. I have another book I didn't bring up called Disciplines of the Holy Spirit. It's very important that the Holy Spirit helps us as we practice the spiritual disciplines of prayer and scripture meditation and reading, solitude and silence, fasting, fellowship, and so on and so forth. We all know about the spiritual disciplines. And we talk a lot about the spiritual disciplines. And we disciple people in the spiritual disciplines. We tell them you need to pray every day, have a quiet time with the Lord, have time in solitude and silence, read your Bible, you know, have fellowship. That's how you grow. And it is true, but it's not completely true. It is not the spiritual disciplines that make you grow. Who makes you more like Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, spiritual disciplines are nothing. In fact, they're dangerous. They can be legalistic, you know. Read five chapters of the Bible every day. Pray one hour every day. 
that is the outside. It doesn't matter. You spend one hour or 15 minutes, you read one chapter or, 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 or one verse, you know. The point is, as I said in my book, Disciplines of the Holy Spirit, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. The heart of the matter in anything and everything is always a matter of the heart. It's in your heart. It's an internal, your soul. Okay? If you really love God, you long for God, you desire Him, you prefer Him, okay? you prioritize Him, you practice the presence of God, you surrender to the Holy Spirit. See, the big S I want to emphasize today is surrender. Surrender to the S, the big S, Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Surrendering to the Holy Spirit is the secret of victory in the Christian life. Not self-effort. Not trying to pray more, pray harder, read more of the Bible. That's not the secret. The secret is to surrender more to the Spirit so that the Spirit can fill you and anoint you with His power and presence more. And then He will transform you to become more like Jesus. And then the spiritual disciplines will be much more meaningful for you. Okay? The same as counseling. Some of you have training in counseling and, and therapy and in helping people, whether it's lay counselors or professional counselors at the master's level or doctoral level or whatever level that you're at. Hmm? And you're helping people. You can do helping and counseling without the Holy Spirit's help or without acknowledging His help. He's still there helping you though, whether you acknowledge it or not. But it's better to acknowledge Him and to ask Him to take control of your counseling and of you as a counselor, as a vessel in the temple of the Holy Spirit. And He will fill you with His gifts, with His power, with His grace, with His truth, with His love. They will help you to become an even more effective counselor because the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is with you. Okay, that's what I'm covering today. I'm going to talk more about counseling and therapy than about deliverance ministries, but one of my points touches on that. So I sent uh, Georgie, I think, a few uh, slides. Okay, not slides, but outlines, so we can just look at that. Let's pray before we look into uh, these points. Lord, thank you so much for this meeting. Thank you for the people online. Thank you for people in Singapore who continue to be motivated to learn. And uh, we just are grateful that you're here with us. And we're thankful, Lord Jesus, that you did not leave us alone or comfortless or as orphans. When you went to heaven and ascended to heaven after your death and resurrection and your ascension, you sent to us the comforter, the paraclete, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who lives within us now and works through us. And then to bring us into the community of the Trinity, to know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit deeply and to empower us and enable us to be transformed by your grace into the likeness of Christ, which is what discipleship and spiritual formation is all about. That the ultimate goal of any church, any group of Christians, our lives on earth, is to know Jesus and to make him known, to love God and to love others, and to become more and more like Jesus. So help us to keep our lives and our ministry simple with this very, very focused uh, 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 goal in our lives, which is to become more like Jesus. But not through self-effort but through surrender to you. Because without your power, we are nothing, Lord. Without abiding in Christ, you can do nothing. And it's not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Zechariah 4, 6. And Ephesians 5, 18, to be continuously filled with the Spirit. So now in the name of Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you will fill us afresh right now. Anoint us and bless and anoint the teaching and sharing and preaching of your Holy Word now. And just don't just give us information, Lord, because we are overloaded with information and a lot of false information and misinformation through the internet. But now, transformation based on truth in the Word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Protect us from evil. Bless your people now. Bring transformation, not just information. And glorify yourself, O oh God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And we give you the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I don't know what's on the slides. Let's see. Can you help me? The work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Some of the things I, I've published. 1999 is the article. 2022 is the book. So I'm going to talk first about a brief theology of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Pneumatology. In the field of systematic theology, the subsection on the Holy Spirit as God and His role and His functions and His ministries is called pneumatology. All right? You pick up any systematic theology book, you'll have a section there in the doctrine of God. It's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's called pneumatology. One of the best books on systematic theology is by Wayne Grudem, G-R-U-D-E-M, and I highly recommend that for your reading if you're interested. So I cannot cover the whole area of pneumatology in 10, 15 minutes, all right? They will not do justice to the field of theology. People study the Holy Spirit for a whole quarter, okay, for 10 weeks and th three hours every time in you know, the lectures. I just want to cover three major aspects of the Holy Spirit's functioning that are particularly relevant to counseling and therapy and uh, deliverance ministries, okay? 
And there are many books that have been written on the Holy Spirit, many, more and more recently. Pneumatology books. I don't have time to quote all of them. You can check the references, okay, especially in my textbook. There are also quite a few books now written on the Holy Spirit and counseling, specifically counseling, yeah, including a book written by a Pentecostal friend of mine uh, 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 you know, uh, on, on this uh, particular topic. But I will not get into all the details. Okay. Now, the three major aspects of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? The first I want to cover is the Spirit's power and gifts. This first aspect is particularly uh, popular and well-known amongst Charismatics and Pentecostals. Those of us who are from Charismatic backgrounds and Pentecostal backgrounds love this. We talk a lot about the power of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit, the dramatic manifestations of the Spirit, right? Uh, people fall down, they shake all over, they speak in tongues, right? And, and the miracles happen, and healings happen, and deliverances happen. Is that true? Yes, hallelujah, it's all in the book of Acts. But is that all there is? No. You see, there's a one-sided view of the Holy Spirit. You want to really know about the acts of the Holy Spirit? Look at the book of Acts. My friend Peter Wagner has now gone home to be with the Lord for quite a few years now. He wrote a book, a commentary on Acts, and he called it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The book of, uh, the book of Acts is really the Acts of the Apostles, but really is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles and the early disciples. And you check the book of Acts, which I don't have time to go into references, okay, you will find that you, you will see that there are times and instances in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit filled the disciples, right? And then what happened? Mighty uh, signs and wonders happen, right? The place was shaken, they spoke in tongues, and so on and so forth. That does happen, all right, in the book of Acts. But if you look at the book of Acts very carefully, you will find that there's also the more quiet works of the Spirit. You'll come across verses like the, and they were filled with the Spirit and with peace, period. They were filled with the Spirit and they were filled with joy, period. They were filled with the Spirit and they preached the gospel boldly. And then other parts, they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in tongues. They were filled with the Spirit and the whole place shook. Are you with me? They are the dramatic acts of the Spirit and they are also the quieter works of the Spirit. Both are equally important. And in fact, more recently I've been emphasizing that the gift of tears is a gift on the Holy Spirit. Weeping, lament, particularly during this painful time of the pandemic. Okay, where there's so much suffering. Huh? And Jesus wept, you know. Shortest verse in the Bible, where is it from? John 11, 35, right? And we, all want to say, we always talk about uh, spiritual formation and discipleship today, right? What are we we're talking about? You want to become more like Jesus, right? Huh? Huh? So we want to become more like Jesus, we want to have more power, more signs and wonders and so on. If you become more like Jesus, you will also weep more. Because Jesus wept. And in Hebrews chapter 5, he was hurt through his loud crying and tears in his prayers, Okay? So gifts are a gift of the Spirit. And we know that from the early church fathers and mothers, the Abbas and the Amas who went to the desert for years. In the first five to 700 years of church history, which is the patristic spirit. And read that they went to the desert for years and, and they go to the caves, you know, in the special places of, of, of solitude and silence. It's called desert spirituality. You need to read more about these things, okay? They really will bless you. And these people are closer to Jesus because they live closer to Jesus' time. And one of the biggest blessings and gifts they talked about that we don't talk about today, especially in charismatic and Pentecostal circles, we need to redress and address that balance, okay? It's the gift of tears. The gift of tears, all right? And when you weep, it's the Spirit moving you. Sometimes with groanings that cannot be uttered in prayer, for example. Romans chapter 8. It's the same Holy Spirit. So don't overemphasize tongues. If you emphasize tongues, please emphasize tears too. Same Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Okay, so all those things keep in mind. Huh? Now, okay, we're talking about the, the, the importance of being filled with the Spirit. Hmm? And in Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul, the writer of Ephesians says, be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek there, it's a present continuous tense. Be continuously filled with the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit day by day, moment by moment. And how do we become filled with the Spirit? Very simple. Just say a simple prayer of surrender. Lord, I'm here, Holy Spirit of God. Cleanse me, fill me with your power and presence now. I surrender myself to you. Fill me with your power and presence. I invite you to fill me. You're already in me, but fill me up. Don't just be in me, but take control of my life. I surrender to you and he'll fill you. you know, and you don't have to have any special feelings. You don't have to speak in tongues, but you trust God as you ask the spirit of God to fill you. He will fill you. Sometimes dramatically, sometimes quietly, but he'll guide you. And throughout the rest of the day, ask him to continue to fill you, especially after you've sinned. Now confess your sins to the Lord, I'm sorry, cleanse me, fill me afresh with the Spirit. Fill me afresh with the Spirit. And as a counsellor, while you're counselling, always praying, Spirit guide me. Lord, bring healing to this person. Lord, direct me. 
quietly. You see, you're praying in the Spirit. Are you with me? And those of you who speak in tongues, you can pray in tongues, but quietly. Please don't pray in tongues loudly with your client, huh? especially if your client is not a Christian, huh? and your client is a Christian who may be in rebellion and against God, you know, and then you're, you're, you're counseling halfway, and then you go, and you're frightened the daylights of them. They're wanting to just counsel talking. Gibberish, right? The person with the gift of tongues can control the tongues. In case you're wondering, I speak in tongues too, okay, so no big deal. Paul says he spoke in tongues more than everybody. But forget about tongues, Paul says. It's not so important. Prophetic words are more important. The word of God is more important because they can understand the language. Tongues they don't understand. And you can stumble non-Christians and others. So if it's a gift of tongues, you're bringing in tongues, please be quiet, especially during counseling session. Uh, you can just quiet, okay, quietly. You don't even have to pray in tongues. You can just pray quietly in your heart for them. Are you with me so far? All right, so now let's talk about the Spirit's power and gifts. This emphasis in charismatic and Pentecostal circles is not wrong. It is just not balanced if that's all you emphasize. But we must emphasize this. And how about non-charismatic circles? How about our fundamentalist circles? Our conservative evangelicals who sometimes are anti-charismatic. That's also wrong. You go to the other side. You quench the spirit. You grieve the spirit like that. You see, we must not do that. Huh? So the spirit's power and gifts are important. Acts 1.8 You shall receive power after the spirit has come upon you, Jesus said. And you shall be my witnesses. Very important for witnessing and evangelism, the power of the spirit. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right here locally, you know, in Judea in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, very important in the context of witnessing, evangelism, social concern, and mission. In Ephesians 5.18, be continuously filled with the Spirit. Then, there are four major uh, passages in Scripture on the gifts of the Spirit. Hmm? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. You notice that there are two chapter 12s and two chapter 4s, right? Easy to remember, right? But don't get the books mixed up. Don't memorize. So I know, I know. In chapter 12, chapter and chapter 4. Ephesians 12, 1 Peter 12, 1 Corinthians 4, Romans 4. Wrong. It's Romans 12, okay? And, and, and 1 Corinthians 12. Ephesians does not have 12 chapters, all right? Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter doesn't have 12 chapters. 1 Peter 4. You look at that, you'll come across at least a dozen or 20 or so uh, spiritual gifts. And Peter Wagner added a few more in his book, Your Spiritual Gifts Can Help Your Church Grow. He has at least, actually he has the longest list of spiritual gifts of any author. 26 of them or 27 of them. And one of them is the gift of martyrdom. Hmm? The special gift God gives you to die for Jesus. That's a gift you can only use once. Huh? You martyr, then you're gone, right? I don't want to make fun of it, okay? I'm not sure whether martyrdom is a gift, okay? It's a calling. If God calls you to die for Jesus, he'll, he'll give you the power to do that. All right, so here we are uh, in terms of the, 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 the Spirit's power and gifts. And what I want to do now is to go through uh, some of them, okay? I want to especially mention six of them. Again, Peter Wagner mentions 26 of them. I don't have time to go through all, through all of them. But the spiritual gifts, what are spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are special abilities God, the Holy Spirit, in the sovereignty of God, gives to some of us as Christians, the body of Christ, right? Gifts that enable us to engage in ministry that will build up the body of Christ and bless the world, okay? Spiritual gifts. It's from God. It's not from you. They are gifts. You don't earn them. You cannot grab them. You can even pray for them. You can pray for them, but it's up to God whether He gives them to you or not. I know of some people who say, I, Lord, give me the gift of tongues. All my charismatic friends say, it's very good. Give me the gift of tongues. And God doesn't give them a gift of tongues. I believe that gift of tongues is available for every Christian, but sometimes God doesn't give the gift of tongues to some Christians because tongues is not everything. The Holy Spirit is everything because He is God. Okay? So you trust God. You come to God and say, fill me, give me the gifts I need and make me a good counselor. So these are the six gifts that you want to ask the Lord for, but it's up to the Lord whether He gives it to you or not, uh, gives, gives them to you or not. And uh, the point to keep in mind is this. These are not the only ones. But these are the six that I feel are particularly relevant to the ministry of counseling. Number one, the gift of exhortation or encouragement. Okay? The gift of exhortation or encouragement. Romans 12, 8. This is a special gift that God gives to some of us to speak words of love and affirmation and, and support as well as uh, admonition sometimes, okay? That blesses the other person, the counselee they're trying to help and help them feel helped or healed, okay? That is how Peter Wagner defines this gift of encouragement. And the gift of encouragement, by the way, is not the gift of counselling. There's no such thing as a gift of counselling, okay? There's the ministry of counselling. 
And several gifts, this next, these six gifts I mentioned are particularly relevant to counseling. The gift of encouragement is also relevant to preaching and teaching. I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher. But because I have the gift of encouragement, I'm also a good counselor. But what makes a preacher and teacher a good one is that they also have the gift of encouragement. When they speak, when they preach, okay, there's power, there's anointing, and there's encouragement. When you hear their word, you're moved, you see. You're encouraged, you're lifted up to want to change and turn toward God and obey Him. Not every preacher has that gift. Then they don't really have the gift of preaching. All right? The gift of preaching must be uh, coupled with the gift of encouragement. You know what I'm saying? All right? Encouragement is important in preaching too, but very important in counseling. How do you know you have this gift? You fill in a spiritual gifts inventory, but sometimes it doesn't score right. You know, the validity and reliability of these inventories are not very good. Someone reviewed the literature recently, Hathaway, you know, that they're not very valid or reliable. By the way, a lot of these tests, please be careful. Today, the Enneagram, the Myers-Briggs, please, huh, as a psychologist, I'm telling you, a lot of those tests are very bad for reliability and validity. Don't overuse them. Don't call people your number one and number eight and number five, you know, or your T and S or whatever, you know. Come on. You're more than that, okay? Let everyone be unique, all right? All right, so this is the first one, the gift of exhortation or encouragement. How do you know you have it? If you have the gift of encouragement, people will come to you very often already. Why? Because you encourage them. Right? If you don't have the gift of encouragement, how do you know you don't have it? Huh? People don't come back to you. <laughs> they come to you once and they don't come back anymore because you're so discouraging. <laughs> See, you understand what I mean, right? So when people flock to you, people naturally go to you, you might have the gift of encouragement. You might make a good counselor. Okay? Remember that. Number two, the gift of healing. Ah, here's where the charismatic gifts are important. 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and 28. The gift of healing. Not just physical healing, but emotional healing, spiritual healing. Huh? I mean, you pray for people, people will get touched. The third gift is the gift of wisdom. Or from a charismatic point of view, a word of wisdom. Hmm? That God gives you a word of wisdom that applies the scripture into this problem or area of the person's life. 1 Corinthians 12, 8, a word of wisdom. Then knowledge, or a word of knowledge, 1 Corinthians 12, 8, that is a factual thing that you didn't know about the client that God gives you. One time John Wimber shared about this. He was just preaching to a crowd, praying for healing, and then a lady came up, you know, and he went down to pray for them, uh, pray for her after the uh, at the end of the service, you know. And the lady was just crying and crying and crying. And John Wimber asked her, oh, you want to tell me more? How can I pray for you? My family, my family, you know, my husband. That's all she said. And suddenly, he got a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Supernatural. Not him. The, 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 the person he wanted to pray for didn't even mention it. Just said, my husband. How did the word of knowledge come? At the back of the wall. A-D-U-L-T-E-R-Y. Adultery. And John Wimber is mature enough to say, Oh, God just gave me a word of knowledge. You have committed adultery. Or your husband has committed adultery. Is that right? He didn't say any of that. He didn't say any of that. He got the word. He kept it. And he wisely was a good counselor. said, Can you tell me more about your husband? You're crying. What's happening there? You see? Non-directive. Draw them out. Listen. Then she broke down and cried, my husband, my husband, so many affairs, so many affairs. You see? Adultery. He already knew. He had to do with adultery. Did not say it, but used it to guide his questioning and his counseling. You see the application of this? The Holy Spirit can help you to get at the root problem much more quickly by giving you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom sometimes. But I'll talk about that in a moment, okay? Then the, the gift of discerning of spirits. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. The gift of discerning of spirits. The special ability God gives to some of us to be able to tell whether something is really from God or from the flesh of the person or from the devil. How do you know it's from God? I received a word from God. How do you know it's from God? Just because someone said, I heard from God. God told me this. God may not have told you this. The devil might have told you this and you're deceived. Or you might have told yourself. Or was still mental illness. You have a hallucination or a delusion. You see? How do you tell? Whatever word God gives you must be consistent with Scripture. If it contradicts the Scripture, it cannot be from God. One time I had someone long time ago tell me, oh, God spoke to me, you know, to really go to bed and sleep with this woman because she's so lonely, but she's married. God told me to commit adultery. Wow, Lao. <laughs> cannot be God, ah. <laughs> okay? The devil, yes. Yourself, yes. God, no. You understand what I mean, right? Use common sense and use the Bible to guide you, okay? Yeah, don't throw out the Bible, okay? Discerning of spirits according to Scripture too. But that 
ability to discern is very helpful. That's why usually in prayer for deliverance and so on, whether it's really demonic or something else or mental illness, it's good to have discernment. And therefore, a prayer ministry team is very good. You have a team of three or four people. They're filled with the Spirit. They all have different gifts. They can discern together. And if all of them agree, you know, it probably is correct. You follow? So don't trust yourself too much. Learn to trust the Lord and be in the community of believers. And finally, the gift of mercy. Romans 12, 8, you know. When somebody is sick, if you're the first person to go and visit them and bring them chicken soup, you probably have the gift of mercy. <laughs> okay? Compassionate heart. Soft, tender heart for people. Gift of mercy. That gift is very good, okay? But also can be bad. In what sense? If you don't know how to use it properly, you will overdo it. You can burn out. So you need to keep a bit of limits. No, you cannot help everyone. But being merciful is a good thing. Did you hear the, 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 the six things? Let me repeat it. Huh? So encouragement, healing, wisdom, knowledge, discerning of spirits, and mercy. And there are others. Pentecostals and Charismatics will say, what else are important? The gift of prophecy, of teaching, of faith, of miracles, of tongues, of intercession. Those are some of the other spiritual gifts. So the Spirit's power and the Spirit's gifts are very important. They empower you, anoint you, enable you to do the work of ministry, including counseling and deliverance ministries. We need to depend on Him. And one last thing about gifts, okay? A good friend at Fuller named Russell Spittler, S-P-I-T-T-L-E-R. He died a few years ago. Russell Spittler was our provost for a while, and he was a professor of New Testament interpretation. He's a Pentecostal. By PhD is from Harvard, okay? Very, very uh, well-educated scholar. He was an expert on 1 Corinthians, okay? And on spiritual gifts. And he said this, one of the best definitions of spiritual gifts is that they are gracelets from God. Or better still, droplets of grace. I want you to visualize that. Spiritual gifts are droplets of grace from God or gracelets given to you from God. You like that? Huh? That means there's no basis for boasting. It's not from you. You don't have it. God gave it to you as a gift. Gracelets, droplets follow, fall, fall, falling from heaven by the Holy Spirit and infused into you. Therefore, no basis for pride at all. Every basis for humility and gratitude and love and worship. That's why people who are really filled with the Spirit will never be arrogant. Will never try to show off like some of these TV preachers, you know, <laughs> make you fall down. You know, all this uh, dramatic show. If you're really filled with the power of the Spirit, you'll never show off like that. You just do it like Jesus did, you follow? And give God the glory and don't draw attention to yourself. Are you with me? Amen. Humility is part of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we're going to talk about soon. Okay, so you've got the power and gifts. Important, huh? But there are two other aspects to make sure you have biblical balance in your pneumatological view or your doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The second area, that, can we go on to the next one? Somebody help me with the, the Spirit's uh, truth, okay? John 14, 16 to 17, verse 26, and John 16, 13. Hmm? When the Spirit of truth is come, He'll guide you into all truth, right? And teach you what is to come. Hmm? So psychotheological truth, integrative truth, all truth comes from the Holy Spirit. Huh? And the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, uh, inspired the writing of God's Word, right? You know, uh, in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Every word of prophecy, every word of God is inspired by God, by the Spirit. So the Spirit inspired the writing of Scriptures. The Bible is an inspired Word of God. And the same Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of God's Word will also illuminate and reveal to you the truth of God's Word. That's why whenever we come to the Bible to read the Bible or to study the Bible, we must pray for the Holy Spirit's filling. We must pray afresh for the Holy Spirit's illumination. We must pray afresh for the Spirit's revelation, you see. You and I cannot understand the Bible on our own. Our intelligence is too small. We are dealing with eternal truth that is so cheap and so deep you cannot even touch it. But when it's revealed by the Holy Spirit, you see, suddenly the light goes on. Suddenly you see eternity. Suddenly the perspective changes. You want to change your negative thinking? You want to be transformed by the renewing of mind? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the word to you, you see. Once that word of revelation comes and illumination comes, you will never be the same again. That's why Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, you see. Huh? So the Spirit is truth. The Bible. Whatever the Spirit does, He will never contradict the Bible, like I said earlier. He wrote the Bible for us through people. Huh? 
And so the Holy Spirit's truth is very important. So truth is important. We must be steeped in scripture. If you really want to do good Christian counseling, whether it's a lay counselor or professional therapist, you need to be steeped and grounded and saturated with the word of God. Hallelujah. Uh, you say, well, Xiang Yang, you're saying all oh, very basic things. Ah, we learned this many years ago. Yes, go back to the basics. Don't complicate the Christian life too much. It's very, very simple. Remember, kiss, huh? keep it short and simple. I better remember, keep it short and simple now. But K-I-S-S, -S, right? sometimes they keep it simple or keep it short, stupid. <laughs> keep it short, keep it simple. The Christian life is very simple. Don't complicate it. Know the word. Go back to basics. It's not too complicated, okay? The more we study the theology, the more we complicate things. With us foolish human mind, it's so small. And we dissect the Bible, we criticize the Bible, we say God cannot say this, Jesus can cannot say that. How do you know? You're not Jesus, okay? Jesus is smarter than you. You need to trust him, even if it doesn't make sense yet. Uh, he will speak to you. So the truth, huh? we need to know the truth. And this is the strength of the traditional, conservative, fundamentalist Christians, right? They're always back into the Bible. Always back into the Bible. Always Bible study. BSF, Bible study fellowship. It's all good. But sometimes when you do too much to the extreme, what happens? You forget point number one. The Spirit's power and gifts. Huh? And charismatic and many courses, you emphasize and overemphasize uh, point number one, right? You forget this point number two, the truth. See? But when you have spirit and word together, that's dynamite. It's more than dynamite. It's nuclear power spiritually. Huh? The anointing of the spirit through the word of God will transform lives and touch lives in your counseling ministries and deliverance ministries too. You with me? Okay, then the third one, the Spirit's fruit. This is very important. I want to take a couple of minutes now and talk about Galatians 5, 22, 23, okay? Very quickly, but the fruit of the Spirit is, huh? is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness or humility, and self-control. Against such, there's no law. I want to say two or three things here because my time is running out. I still have five more points of it, how the Holy Spirit works in counseling and different ministries. First, please notice the Greek. I know many of us don't know Greek here. I don't know Greek either. I read the commentaries and they translate and transliterate the Greek for me. All right? for the, but the fruit of the Spirit is. You check every, Christ, uh, every English translation of the Bible for, of Galatians 5, 22, 23. You cannot find any translation from the Greek to the English that, that says, but the fruits of the Spirit are. Try to find that in any translation, whether NIV or RSV or NASB or King James or New King James. None. Why? Because if you translate it as, but the fruits of the Spirit are, you are contradicting the tense and the grammar of the Greek. Every Bible scholar who knows anything will tell you that. All right? Read the commentaries, the experts in the Greek. But the fruit of the Spirit is singular. One main fruit, which is love, agape. God, God is love. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is actually God. God like love. Other-centered love, agape. But how come we have those other eight things? The other eight things are further manifestations and elaborations of love. But the fruit of the Spirit is love that is also full of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Do you see that? That means you cannot pick and choose what fruit you like. It's one fruit, all of it or none of it. The Holy Spirit produces this fruit gradually in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and that is crucial. Love is the most important and the most therapeutic force in the world. If you really love the people you're ministering to, healing will come eventually. If you don't love them, you may be an expert in the techniques of counseling and so on and so forth, and you will not help people very much. The people that you're reaching out to and counseling with and helping in people helping counseling ministries, helping them with their problems in life, okay? They are people who will be touched by your love. I worked for three years in a hospital in London, Ontario, Canada, after my PhD at McGill University. I moved from Montreal to London, Ontario, Canada. My first job after my PhD in clinical psychology. And I worked at University Hospital in the University of Western Ontario, in London, Ontario, Canada, not London, England. I was a consultant psychologist to the epilepsy unit in the, in the whole department of clinical neurological sciences about the brain okay, and epilepsy and so on. And there I saw many patients with epilepsy 
with all kinds of memory problems as well as anxiety, depression, as well as some general psychiatric uh, patients with anxiety, depression, PTSD, marital issues, and all kinds of other issues. Part of our assessment process is that toward the end of therapy, we ask them, so what was helpful to you in this therapy? We do pre-post testing, making sure that we document the improvements, if any. And many of my patients got well. By the grace of God, I'm a really good therapist, okay? So I do cognitive behavioral therapy and so on and help them. And I teach them many helpful techniques because CBT has many helpful techniques. They're empirically based. You know what? In the majority, in those three years I was there, when I asked the patient toward the end of therapy, what was helpful to you? I expected them to say things like, oh, the relaxation techniques really helped me to calm down. Huh? You taught me how to change my thinking to more positive thinking. It really helped, Dr. Tan. And you teach me how to do problem solving. You taught me coping skills. That really helped. Almost nobody said that as the first point. Almost everyone said this. And it embarrassed me a bit, but I, I knew it was the Lord. It's not me. You know what they said? Dr. Tan, you are the most loving doctor that I ever met. And you really cared for me. You touched my heart. Thank you so much. You really helped me. I say, okay, thank you very much. What else? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, the relaxation techniques. <laughs> they forget the techniques. They remember your love. Oh, the lack of it. And you know why they remember? Because when the epilepsy patient forgets to keep the appointment, you know, epilepsy has a lot of memory problems. Huh? Sometimes due to the anticonvulsant medication, sometimes due to the epilepsy, the epileptogenic focus, depends on which part of the brain, especially the temporal lobe, okay? Your amygdala, your hippocampus is affected. So your memory is not very good. So sometimes I wait for 10, 15 minutes, okay? Past the hour. You have a 4 o'clock appointment. 4.15, they're still not there. You know what I do? I call them. I call them. The doctor. I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm a doctor, okay? Psychology. I call them. Hi, this is Dr. Ten. The patient says, oh, do we have an appointment today? I thought it was tomorrow, 4 o'clock. I said, no, today. Mr. Brown, whatever his name was. Said, I'm so sorry. Can I come tomorrow at 4? I said, well, let me look at my book. Yeah, I happen to have a 4 o'clock free. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. One minute phone call from Dr. Ten. Not Nurse Wong. The nurse. I didn't ask the nurse to call. I didn't ask the receptionist to call. I called them myself. Now, some people say, oh, that's not good professional boundaries. Why not? Just because I'm a doctor with my light lab coat and so on? Why? Why can I not call my patient directly for one minute? They remember, you know. They remember that you remember and you care. Love is more powerful than your techniques. Are you with me? It's very important, the spirit's fruit. So now I pull this all together, okay? All the major aspects of the spirit here, the all three major aspects must come, come together and coalesce together, okay? Let me put it this way. Power without love can lead to abuse. Power without truth can lead to heresy. But power rooted in biblical truth and appropriately and gently used with Christ-like love can be deeply therapeutic and bring healing and wholeness to clients in the brokenness and pain of their lives. It can also lead to renewal and revival. Power based on truth expressed in love. You with me? Oh! the three major aspects of the Holy Spirit coming together in balanced biblical functioning and perspective. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in counseling, in therapy, in deliverance ministries, in any and every ministry. Okay? I can stop here. But can you give me 10 more minutes, 5 more minutes? Okay? I'm not stopping yet. Now I have to give you the 5 points we have there of how the Spirit works in counseling and therapy, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit in counseling and psychotherapy. Next. So, so before I talk about how he works explicitly, he can work quietly. The Holy Spirit can work in any way, any time. You cannot control his ways of working. But if you want to have explicit integration where you pray with your clients, guide them with the Bible, pray in a healing prayer and so on, the Holy Spirit can maybe work more explicitly. But whether implicitly, quietly or explicitly, directly and openly, these are the five ways that the Holy Spirit can work in a counseling session. Okay? First, the Holy Spirit can directly empower or enable the Christian therapist to discern the root problems of the client more accurately and perhaps more quickly by giving relevant and specific words of knowledge or wisdom, as I said from 1 Corinthians 12, to the Christian therapist in assessing and helping the client. Chuck Swindoll, from a more conservative fundamentalist background, talked about when he was doing pastoral counseling with his uh, parishioners in his church, how the Holy Spirit gives him nudges and promptings. He says, I feel prompted and nudged by the Holy Spirit sometimes to go in this direction, in that direction. Huh? That's not the Pentecostal or charismatic way of saying it, right? How do the Pentecostals and charismatics put it? I receive words of knowledge. I receive words of wisdom from the Lord to guide me. And then 
Chuck Swindoll, I receive nudges and promptings. I don't care what you call them. You receive supernatural help from the Holy Spirit. Yeah? And He guides you and clears up the assessment, makes you see things much more clearly than without the Spirit's help by giving you those gifts. Okay, so that's one way. He uses spiritual gifts to help you get to the problem more. And then, as part of the use of that gift, okay, you need to be flashing up prayers to the Spirit during your counseling session and even during your deliverance prayer ministry. Spirit of God, guide me. Spirit of God, please bring healing. Spirit of God, please help us. I'm stuck right now. Or the client is stuck. There's a lot of pain there. Please have mercy. Minister grace. Minister mercy. Quietly. Uh, flash prayers. You know. Spirit of God, guide us. Spirit of God, protect us. We sense a demonic attack now while I'm, I'm praying and while I'm helping the client. See, you're continuously walk in the Spirit and pray quiet flash prayers. So that's first, okay? Number two, the Holy Spirit can provide clear spiritual direction regarding God's will to both the Christian therapist and the client as they engage in more explicit integration practices during the counseling session, okay? Including praying together, using and discussing, discussing scripture, opening de op openly dealing with spiritual issues and struggles. As I already mentioned before, the Spirit can do this and provide clear guidance and spiritual direction in, in more implicit integration approaches in any way He wants. But especially when you're praying with a client, when you're guiding with a scripture, when you're openly talking about spiritual struggles in God, the Holy Spirit speaks. He brings revelation, anointing, illumination. Okay, That's the second way. The Holy Spirit gives spiritual direction. In this context, the true spiritual director is always the Holy Spirit, not you. Today, there's a lot on spiritual direction. A lot of people go for their in spiritual direction and so on. And then they become a spiritual director. You have to be careful not to over-professionalize the practice of spiritual direction. Spiritual direction simply means spiritual mentoring, guiding someone in a prayerful way to listen to God. It's the Holy Spirit who is really the spiritual director. So depend on Him. He'll speak to you in the session and show you God's will. Number three. The Holy Spirit can directly minister to and deeply touch a client in powerful ways with His healing grace and transforming power anytime hmm? during the session, right? Suddenly as you're talking, suddenly the Holy Spirit falls on, on the person, you know? And so the Spirit can do that. But usually the Spirit works through certain processes like prayer and especially prayer for inner healing. Huh? You go through the seven steps of inner healing prayer. You take people back to the past and relive their painful memories, asking Jesus to come into the past and asking the Holy Spirit to minister the healing presence of Jesus to them. And the Holy Spirit shows up, touches the client. The client might break down and cry, be touched by the Lord and receive love and healing. The Holy Spirit does that, okay? Number four, the Holy Spirit can enable the Christian therapist to discern the presence of the demonic or whether there's demonization or demonic oppression in the client's life. This is the part about deliverance ministry. We must ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us to discern whether it's a demonic element or not. But there are some criteria. Okay. Now here, point number four. Are you with me? I'm on point number four now. Huh? All right. But the, but the sub-points, I, I did not elaborate. Okay. How do you know whether something is demonic or mental illness or both? That's a very important question. And Dr. Leslie Lim here, a consultant psychiatrist, has written a book on mental illness or de demonization where he goes into more detail. But I'll give you a very simple four-point guideline, okay? You still need the Holy Spirit. You still need discerning. You still need a prayer team to help you, usually. And if you don't have time for a prayer team, you're there and the demonic element manifests itself. You have to pray to cast out the demon. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go where Jesus sends you, never to come back again. That's a simple prayer of deliverance. In the name of Jesus, not your name, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave John or Mary to go where Jesus sends you, never to come back again. And I bind you there in the name of Jesus. Amen. You have the power to say that, anyone and every one of you. But make sure you're walking in the Spirit before you pray like this. Otherwise, the demon will attack you. Huh? So you make sure that you're covered by the blood of Christ and you pray that protection for yourself. But here are four criteria, not foolproof. But from manuals of exorcism over years of church history, these are the four that I found to be most useful. Not foolproof, but helpful. Number one, if there's a demonic element, not just mental illness, there will usually be a very overwhelming negative reaction to the, uh, to the name of Jesus. You mention Jesus, you mention anything Christian, you know, there will be a negative reaction like, you know, they'll get angry because the demons are angry. Okay? So usually there's a very strong overwhelming uh, negative reaction to Jesus. Psychotic people, schizophrenic people, mentally ill people don't usually react like that. I've seen them in the hospital. And when I mention Jesus, most of them say, oh, I like Jesus. In fact, I say, I am Jesus. Okay? 
they don't they know they love Jesus. They're not demon demonized. They're mentally ill. I'm serious. Some of them think they are Jesus. That's a delusion, and it's very sad when I see that happen. It brings out sadness, not fear. That's not demonic. That's mental illness. They need antipsychotic medications to control that. Are you with me? But when it's demonic, there's a strong negative reaction to Jesus. Because Satan's, uh, Satan's enemies are Satan's enemies. Satan's minions, our enemies, hate Jesus. Because Jesus has conquered sin, Satan and death on the cross. They are defeated. All the power that Satan has now is Bora. <laughs> you know what Bora is in Malay? It's bluff. It's fake. He doesn't have that much power. The Lord has the power to overcome. Okay? So, that's the number one. Number two, if it's really demonic, you will often experience an overwhelming sense of evil in the presence of that person. Why? Because there's an evil spirit there. So you come to the room, you start counseling with them, and suddenly you feel, wow, this is a really yucky, uh, very, very evil spirit, uh, evil feeling, okay? Now, of course, some people say, but Dr. Ten, that's not foolproof. I told you it's not foolproof. Suppose you watch too many uh, Frankenstein movies the night before. <laughs> And you ate too much laksa or maybe you had a pizza the night before. And you have a night nightmares. And then you come in the morning, 9 o'clock, your first patient. And you sit down and suddenly you feel everything is evil. <laughs> it's nothing to do with demonic because you, you watch too many Frankenstein movies the night before. Don't do that. But you're prepared, you come, everything is fine. And suddenly you feel a real sense of evil. Maybe there's a demon there. Okay? Second, huh? overwhelming sense of evil. Number three, you take a history. Hmm? And they are rational enough to give you a proper history. There's usually an involvement of the cults or the occult, okay? And some of them have given themselves to the goddess and so on and so forth. They are bound by demonic spirits already. And number four, number four is not very helpful to me. When the Catholic manuals of exorcism, they talk about olfactory smell. If they are filled with demons, they smell like rotten eggs, like sulfur, yucky smell, okay? But if you have all four, you come to a session and you talk to a person, you mention Jesus, you know, and then you feel an overwhelming sense of evil and you ask for the history, yeah, I'm in the occult and the cults and so on, I've been given to the goddess and so on, and then you smell sulfur and rotten eggs, you probably are facing a demonic situation. And if it manifests itself and starts attacking you, you must take control. You cannot say, ah, sorry, ah, don't attack me. I refer you to prayer ministry team. After the session, please go and see them. Ah. Besaya, too late, ah, more panfara. Okay? No, no, no joke, right? You cannot do that. So what do you do? You take the authority of the believer in Christ. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go where Jesus sends you, never to come back again. You notice I don't waste time saying, I command you to come to attention. I command you to tell me your name. You know, tell me your name. Then I cast you out by name. You don't have to do all that. Look at all the times Jesus cast out demons. Never ask them to name themselves. The one time he asked is, what is your name? And my name is Legion, for there's many in me. He was asking for the name of the person, ah, not the name of the demons. Ah. What is your name? My name is Legion, because I have a lot of demons in me. Jesus treated that person as a person. Everybody else treated him as cuckoo or demons. But he was not a demon to Jesus. And basically, what Jesus did was this, okay? Hi, buddy. I love you, man. I'm going to free you. What's your name? And legion. You see, his whole self-concept was based on the demons in him. And Jesus cast them out, right? And then he was in his proper mind. That's the only one. Every other time Jesus cast out demons, he said, no, out, right? Don't talk to demons. Why? Because they lie. And if they lie, why you talk to them? <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> They're lying. <laughs> you don't need to know their name. You just cast them out. Are you with me? Keep it short and simple. Don't complicate deliverance ministries. Satan will love you to get stuck. Oh, you know, there's a manual here. You now we have to spend you know, five hours fasting and prayer. And it all depends on you. You fast, you do all this, you know. The power is not from your fasting. The power is not from your flagellation of yourself. The power is from Jesus. Hallelujah. And you just submit yourself to the power of Jesus. Okay? Now I talk about deliverance ministries. <laughs> Let's move on, okay? And finally, <laughs> finally, there's some books on, on deliverance ministries, okay? that you can read. I have no time here. And finally, fifth and finally, the Holy Spirit can work deeply in the Christian spiritual formation into deeper Christ-likeness of both the client and the therapist and the counsellor when you practice the spiritual disciplines like prayer, the word, solitude, silence, take a personal retreat. The Holy Spirit can work through all that. But it can also work through suffering and pain, but also through good, joyful experiences. So not just post-traumatic growth or PGT, but post-ecstatic growth, okay? That you can grow through 
uh, positive experiences as well. Like right now, I have a granddaughter who brings a lot of joy to us, okay? So the Holy Spirit can bring all this growth in both the counsellor as well as the counsellee. And so this is the last point I want to make as I wrap up here, okay? When you obey the Lord and use the spiritual gifts God has given you and get some basic training in how to listen, how to really empathize, how to help people, when you sacrificially, in the power of the Spirit, love people who are hurting, especially with mental illness and mental disorders, you're patient with them, you come alongside them, you pray for them, you love them. They are not the only ones who are going to be blessed, you know. You will be blessed by God too. This is called the helper therapy principle that Reisman, Frank Reisman, a social worker years ago in the 1960s wrote about. How you are helped as a helper or counselor as you help others. Hmm? So God will bless you too. And last thing I want to say, I can say a lot more. I better stop here because of time. We have to have Q&A. This is the last point I want to make. How many of you have heard people saying, that you can bring someone only as far as you have gone. Have you heard that before? As a counselor, as a pastor, a minister, you can bring someone only as far as you have gone. So you better go quite far. Because if you've not gone quite far, you can only bring them as far as you've gone. And if you've not gone quite far, they're not going to go quite far. So what are we saying? All of growth and all of counseling is dependent on you. How self-centered can we be in our theology? It's all about Jesus, not about me. So that's why in counseling, in deliverance ministries and so on, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and He takes both you and your counseling further than you have gone. Hallelujah. Huh? That's why as a counselor, I don't panic. I just trust God. I go for the ride. I help. And then after a session, although it's hard, I come home, I say, wow, Lord, I have grown too. And so as my counseling grown, hallelujah, praise be to God, all by grace that you don't deserve. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been sanctified. By grace one day you shall be glorified with new bodies that will not rot. Hallelujah. Hmm? Are you with me? God will bring you further than you've gone. The extent of your effectiveness as a counselor, as a pastor, as a minister is not dependent on you. It's dependent on God. And God is very good and very gracious and very loving. Hallelujah, right? In the end, what we do? We all praise God. Huh? We all rest in God. We all rejoice in the Lord. Amen? Uh, many more things I can say, but I better stop here. Okay? Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, there's an interesting question here. Interesting question. What aspects of teaching of psychotherapy are not Christian and hence to avoid? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a question? Yeah. What aspects of okay. teaching or aspects of psychotherapy okay. are not Christian? Okay, that's too general a question. You cannot say what teachings of psychotherapy. You should talk about teachings of which school of psychotherapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of the uh, authors of a secular textbook said that there are over a thousand schools of psychotherapy today. It's no way, you know. But in my book, I cover the 15 or 20 major approaches to psychotherapy. So if you read my book, you'll see the strengths and the weaknesses of each psychotherapeutic approach, the empirical evidence that supports the efficacy or effectiveness or does not support the, the effectiveness, okay? And then I have a biblical perspective, pointing out their strengths and weaknesses from Bible's perspective. So I cannot give you too many, uh, uh, I cannot answer this question in the generic, but I can give you one or two simple examples, okay? So for example, uh, Carl Rogers, well-known uh, founder of uh, non-directive uh, counseling and then called later on, you know, uh, Mind-centered therapy, and then eventually person-centered therapy. So today it's known as person-centered therapy. And in person-centered therapy, Carl Rogers died some years ago already. He insisted that there were only three major therapeutic conditions that will lead to healing for people. Okay, what he called unconditional positive regard, empathy, and genuineness. All right? And today we call it uh, warmth, empathy, and genuineness. That if you have warmth, empathy, and genuineness toward your client, they will get well eventually, okay? So it's very simple. And he said, don't diagnose people. Don't give people labels and all that because you, 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 you focus on the, on the pathology. You should focus on the fact that if you remove all the conditions of worth, if you show them unconditional positive regard, you really love them and care for them and listen to them deeply and paraphrase and summarize what they're doing. Don't try to give advice. Don't try to teach them techniques. Just be there for them, affirm them, you know, they will grow, okay? 
So if you look at an approach like that, it seems to be like he's, uh, you know, he's um, advocating love, you see, which is partly true, all right, but not agape love, it's kind of therapeutic love. And that's a good thing. That's the strength. He's not focusing on techniques, not treating people as mechanical uh, cases, you know, uh, or pathology cases, but really uh, affirming them and respecting them. And today in the field of uh, uh, positive psychology, there's a approach called positive psychotherapy. Very new in the last few years only. It's in my book. I reviewed the, the whole thing about positive psychotherapy, where you do not emphasize their pathology and the negative things. You don't really diagnose them, but you label their strengths, their virtues, okay, and that you help them to grow. And then you help them to do positive things that be grateful, gratitude, humility, altruism, uh, uh, you know, um, and so on and so forth. The development of patience and so on. So uh, the um, therapist focuses on the strengths rather than the weaknesses of the client, okay? So that's also good and bad. But anyways, let's get back to Carl Rogers, okay? So what's the problem with the Rogerian approach? It's too positive, you see? Just because you show warmth, empathy, and genuineness, the person must, does not always get well, you know? And, and people have negative things. They have evil in their lives they have to deal with. So the view of human nature from a Rogerian point of view is too positive. You see? That if I give you enough love and free you from the conditions of work, you automatically grow and be good. You see? Not so easy. It does not take into sufficient consideration the fallenness of human nature. Okay? So there you need to include other biblical guidelines and so on. That's just one example. I can go on and on. Freudian psychotherapy, Jungian therapy, uh, 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 um, Adlerian therapy, Gestalt therapy, you know, uh, reality therapy, cognitive behavior therapy. All right? They have all got their strengths and weaknesses. But in general, most secular schools of psychotherapy emphasize a lot the self. And we're not careful. Psychotherapy emphasizes a lot on strengthening the self. And if you're not careful, especially American white Western therapy tends to be very individualistic. And if you're not careful, you become very self-centered after a while. And, you, and then you, 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 you know, you're empowered to celebrate your own rights and what you want and, and your desires and just do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt people. That's all not good emphasis, you see. We have to temper that, okay, with love, with family relationships, with society, okay, and with faith. So in many of the psychotherapeutic schools, they emphasize self-effort, self-improvement. From a Christian point of view, we emphasize the opposite. <clears throat> we tell them, don't try so hard. You're not going to make it. Don't worry. Surrender. You see? We teach a different approach. You know? And now the mindfulness-based cognitive behavior therapies are teaching that too. Acceptance. Letting it come, letting it go. You know? And then, of course, letting it go to Jesus if you have a Christian perspective. Okay, I've given you some examples all right, of some things. And then also, for example, in behavior therapy, which has a lot of good techniques like relaxation techniques, um, uh, coping skills, you know, for insomnia, stimulus control techniques and so on, go to bed at a particular time, do relaxation techniques. If you cannot sleep, go to another room until you feel tired, come back again, try to sleep. If you cannot sleep, go to the other room until you're so tired doing this two, three hours, you will fall asleep, okay? Now, the worst thing to do is to stay in bed and toss and turn for three hours, huh? for example. You toss and turn, then you condition your bed into sleeplessness. Then every night you worry, how much longer before I fall asleep? You, know? you go to another room and then when you're tired, come back. Eventually, you're so tired, you will fall asleep. And your bed will be a conditioned stimulus for sleep, not sleeplessness. And you should not watch TV in your bed. You should not eat in your bed and all that, okay? Like they say, there are two S's that you use your bed for, sleep and sex, okay? <laughs> Don't use it for anything else, all right? So anyways... These techniques are helpful. But then, the behavior therapist who's not a Christian will ask you to use all kinds of other techniques that are not Christian and not helpful to help you overcome anxiety. So for example, if you have air aerophobia, you're afraid of flying, right? And especially for me, I don't have aerophobia, thank God, okay? But if I have to fly all the way like I did a few days ago from LAX, Los Angeles in California, to Singapore, direct flight on SIA, huh? Singapore Airlines, 16, 17 hours. If you're afraid of flying, what's young? 16, 17 hours in prison up there, you cannot get home, you know? I want to have a panic attack up there, you know? So the behavior therapist teaches you relaxation techniques, you know, uh, and then and, and, and listen to soft music, get distracted by movies, eat good food. And some of them have advocated use pornography, you know? Watch dirty movies so that you get excited rather than anxious. It might work for some of them, but it's not ethical, it's not moral. You understand what I mean? So you cannot just use anything that works. Even if it works and it's not according to the Bible, it's immoral. You should not use it. You see? So, so feeling better is not the ultimate goal of therapy. 
The ultimate goal of Christian therapy is to help you to become more like Jesus. You know, and Jesus will not encourage you to watch pornography. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And then another example, assertiveness training. Okay. Speak up, stand up, talk back. Stand up, speak up, talk back. Some people are depressed because they are too passive. They learn, they need to say no. They need to speak up more. Yeah. But some of them learn assertiveness training too well. They become aggressive. You know, every little thing they, hey, don't touch, huh? You get out of here, man. No, this is my stuff. Huh? <laughs> so they are very assertive to the point of being aggressive. Now, of course, a good therapist will not teach them to be aggressive, okay? We'll teach them to be assertive. But even assertiveness training, even if they're not rude, you know, I tell you honestly, okay, I'm an expert on assertiveness training, okay? I'll be very honest. I'll confess something to you. You all don't know another part of Siang Yang, okay? <laughs> my wife knows and my kids know, okay? I can be very assertive. When I go to a hotel and, and the person that treats me very badly, Gives me a room that has ends and all this other stuff. Huh? And I complain and they instead of coming to fix it, they're going to scold me back, you know? Then I, then they will have met their match. Because I met Chinese, they don't know what I am, right? White hair. Huh? Maybe this guy just came from, you know, don't know where. Or F will be fresh off the boat. They don't know I'm a PhD psychologist, you see. So they, they don't know. And then they start treating me very badly and then start treating my wife badly. Wow, they cannot. I say, I'm Dr. Tan. I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm a professor. You are dang rude to me. This is not the way to behave, you know. And I'm a, 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 I'm a, a member of this Marriott club. <laughs> I pull out all the guns. I say, I want to see your manager now. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want to see your manager. My manager is not here. That's BS. BS is Chinese for bamboo shoot. <laughs> That's BS, uh, okay. Your manager is behind the door. I saw her walk in. See your manager. Manager comes out. Yes, sir. And I tell her, I say, you know, you guys are crazy if you, talk, if you handle people like me like this. I've been a Marriott member for 30 years. You cannot treat your platinum member like this. And this guy ought to be fired. But I don't want him to be fired. He needs to be taught a lesson. He's extremely rude to my wife and to me. And I will not tolerate that. That's assertiveness training, you see. And then they're very scared. And then they say, okay, very sorry, Dr. Ten. We'll give you extra points. We'll give you a 139. Ah, some more. What else are you going to give me? <laughs> That's that part of me, okay? I'm very gentle and very loving, but you push me to the wrong point, you're gonna. Like Jesus, huh? Jesus is very meek and mild, but you push him to the wrong point, he throw you out of the temple, you know? and he will blast you, the Pharisees. Jesus can be firm too. But that part of me is good to a certain extent, but not so good. Why? I'm too good at assertiveness training. And my kids... And you go to the restaurant, and the steak comes that's bad, and I complain, they have to bring out another steak, you know. My kids sleep, and like, Dad, don't make a scene, Dad, please, Dad. It's so embarrassing to us, you know. So I try not to. Over the years, I've become better. But when we were younger, wow, a lot of people turned down for me. <laughs> so, so that's an example of where psychotherapy can be helpful, but can be too helpful. Huh? We cannot be so selfish. Huh? Even though I'm right, and the guy deserves a scolding. But why scold him so much? I just tell me, hey, don't, don't treat me like that, okay? Please. You push one more step, huh? I'll, I'll talk to your manager, okay? So please, huh? I'm telling you, last more warning. <laughs> That's nicer. Then immediately call for the manager. And if the manager comes and give me a hard time, I want to see your vice president. <laughs> okay, guys. Enough examples, huh? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The way of Jesus is not the way of the world, okay? The way of Jesus always involves death to self, your sinful self, your selfish self. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily, which is a sign of death to false self, and follow me. It's the way of humility, the way of the cross, the way of simplicity, the way of gentleness. That's always the way of Jesus. Violence. In America today, so many people want to protest, but they protest in violence. And that's not even consistent with Martin Luther King Jr. Okay? Martin Luther King against racism, he talked about protest, but always non-violently. In 2020, the summer of violence is terrible in the United States. The government should not have tolerated that. But anyways, okay? Does that help? I can go on and on, okay? But that question is loaded. I can take five hours to talk about that answer, but I'll stop here. Next. Wonderful question and wonderful answer. That's an uh, answer from a pastor, from a pastoral point of view. Now, there's another question here. Does unresolved unforgiveness and bitterness lead to a higher mental health issues? The answer to that is probably yes. I will not say that definitely, but definitely, I mean definitely. But, but obviously, if you are unforgiving, you have bitterness inside, 
it's often correlated with with psychosomatic things and 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 anger and bitterness and depression you know sometimes anxiety sometimes ulcers right because bitterness is not good for you and it leads to new scientific studies will show that some of these kinds of emotional states lead to certain uh, uh, levels of corticosteroids stress hormones and so on that are uh, inflammatory they're against your, your anti-inflammatory inflammatory systems you know and your 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 your, your immune system and so on so there are biological consequences to our psychological consequences to harboring such negative toxic uh, emotions you see so yes it can lead to mental problems and that's why we teach forgiveness even the secular therapists they have found that forgiveness is an important part of healing for mental health issues Okay, and to deal with bitterness. And that's why the seven step model of inner healing prayer is so important. For the Christian, we pray for inner healing. We go back to the past, we cry out the pain to Jesus, and Jesus and the power of the Spirit comes and brings some healing. And the healing will, 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 will release us from that, for, for that, uh, that uh, revenge motive and bitterness, and will give us special strength and grace to forgive the person. But here, let me make a quick comment about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not forgetting. One of my good friends, a theologian, he passed away some years ago, Luke Smith, S-M-E-E-E-S, he wrote a very good book in 1984. It's called Forgive and, Forgive and Forget. The book is very good. The title is horrible. Okay? He, he then moved from the state of psychology for a year or two before he retired and he died. Then the next Christmas, very sad. He just retired. He had to read a few more books. He went up the ladder to fix some Christmas lights in his house that Christmas, a few months after he retired, he fell from the ladder. And he said, and died. Okay, because of brain. So very, very sad, okay. But Lou Smith, he was a couple of doors away from my office. And so I went to his office one day. I said, hey, Lou, your book is very good. I recommend it to all my patients who have problems with forgiveness. You know, forgive and forget. But the title is horrible. You know, the proper title should be forgive even though you cannot forget. He told me, you're right, Xiang Yang, but my publisher refused to make that title because it will not sell. Forgive, even though you cannot forget too long. And no, well, people don't want that. Ah, forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. Very catchy, right? His book sold a million copies because of the title. And the content is very good. The title is bad. The truth is forgive, even though you cannot forget. We have an we have a MBBS medical doctor here, okay, who knows about the brain and so on, okay? So do I. Uh, I have some special uh, knowledge of neuropsychology. Hmm? Your brain, uh, your amygdala, your hippocampus, that subserve memory functionings. Okay? If you're normal and you have a normal brain, uh, you cannot forget. People who forget uh, abnormally, right? They have dementia or they have Alzheimer's, you know? So forgive and forget. So forgive and be, be demented. <laughs> cannot. You will remember. But in inner healing, it's not that God eradicates or deletes the memory. He fuses the memory. He heals the memory so that you're not as bitter but still painful. You follow? So forgive even though you cannot forget. And forgiving is not forgetting. Forgiving is not exonerating either. Forgiving is not excusing the perpetrator of the pain that the person has caused you. That person will still always be responsible. The person who abused you physically, mentally, sexually, whether it's your father, your uncle, or grandfather, or whoever else in your family, that person will always, always be wrong. And you must not say it's right. It was wrong, it was terrible, and you hurt me. But I will not take revenge. I let go of the bitterness and I ask Jesus to bring healing. And then the forgiveness happens in terms of letting go your revenge, a motive, and your resentment. You follow? You forgive even though you cannot forget. Forgive is not an excusing of them. It's obeying God and God will give grace. Are you following me? Forgiveness is also not a one-time deal. You don't forgive and then you know, people say, Dr. Ten, it's been three years now. I guess I never really forgave my father. Why? Because I'm still angry at him. No. You chose to forgive. You must keep on choosing to forgive every day. Renew your forgiveness, you see. And your anger might go down eventually. But it takes time to heal. It's not overnight, even with the Holy Spirit's help, because we live in a fallen world. Okay? I can go on and on. I can do a whole seminar on forgiveness, but you understand? And the research shows that forgiveness in therapy helps to heal the client much more. My friend Everett Worthington is one of the leading experts in the world on forgiveness. He's a Christian psychologist. Okay? And uh, 
there's a lot of data to show that his rich model of forgiveness helps the clients to forgive even though they cannot forget. Let go of the resentment and they actually heal and feel better. Okay? I hope that helps. Huh? It's an act of the will, forgiveness. Yeah. And then God will take care of the emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just feelings, yes. You have to choose to forgive every, every day. Renew that decision. It takes time, okay? So be fair to yourself. Don't flagellate yourself and condemn yourself just because, of, wow, you know, I guess I didn't forgive my dad because I'm still angry with him even two years later. Well, you might have to wait five years. <laughs> you might have to wait forever until, until you get to heaven, you know. But hopefully, less and less angry. Yeah, amen. Less and less bitter. Huh? Okay? So be fair to yourself. Huh? Basically, relax. Uh, be kind to yourself. Receive God's grace. Okay? God is more patient with you than you are with yourself sometimes. And God is very often more patient and kind to us than we are to one another. And pastors especially, sometimes we are so bad from the pulpit. We don't preach grace-filled sermons. We preach judgment-based sermons. And that's not the gospel. Of course there's judgment. But Jesus came to what? To free you from the judgment, to save you. So the gospel is good news, you see. Jesus loves us more than we realize. A very important thing, okay? Jesus likes us more than we realize. Many Christians say, yeah, I know God loves me, but I don't think God likes me. <laughs> God loves you and God likes you. There's a book that just came out. Does God really like you? The answer is yes. God loves spending time with you, okay? And the God who plays like a papa, a grandpa playing with the children. God loves to play with you. God loves to enjoy you. You need to enjoy God. Yeah? And clear out the cobwebs in your mind of the wrong idea and conceptualization of God. Many of us from Chinese, Asian backgrounds, our idea of God is all mixed up with residual ideas from our uh, uh, you know, Eastern background, you know, of, 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 a, of a gods and goddesses that are so angry all the time, you have to uh, uh, make sacrifices, you know, and, and penance to please God, right? No, Jesus already died for you. You don't have to do anything except say thank you and accept Jesus. Hallelujah, right? That's really, really good news, you see? Yeah, okay? I can go on and on, but I better stop preaching. Next. <laughs> How much time do we have, uh, Brother Georgie? Two more minutes. Two, two, two minutes. Two, five. Huh? <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So we can go to the next question. What steps could a believer who is depressed take towards restoration of healthy mental health, good relationships with God, good relationship with God and people? I think I asked someone to ask this question. Because the answer is, read my book on coping with depression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll give you a short answer to that, okay? A brief answer. I'm, my book, Coping with Depression, is a whole book that, that deals with this issue of how do you cope with depression. We have, we have a psychiatrist here. He's an expert on the biological aspects, especially of depression, but all the other aspects too. So I don't want to preempt his, his medical and psychiatric knowledge. Usually... If you have, what is the question? A major, huh? No, a beloved with depression. With right? depression. Who's de yeah. Who is depressed. Yeah. So the first question I have to ask is, what, what, how, how, what kind of depression do you have? You see, How severe is it? If it's mild depression, different story. Major depression, another story. Manic depressive disorder, you know, which is bipolar disorder, even more severe. Okay? If you have bipolar disorder, you definitely need medication. Okay? The medications are interesting. They're not antidepressants per se, although one part of it may be. It's anticonvulsants. Anti-seizure medications help, mm. you know, and then lithium, again, okay, others, yeah. okay? So the doctor here, uh, the medical doctor here and the psychiatrist can tell you more about that. So you might need some medications. You certainly need some therapy. Cognitive behavior therapy is very helpful because depression is very much due to negative thinking. So you have to change the thinking or at least let it come and let it go, okay? And then there are many important interventions that are very helpful for depressed people. And you'd be surprised. They're not just biological unless they're severe kinds of depression. They're not just psychological. They are physical, in that sense, biological, but not medications. Oftentimes, we think of biological treatments, we think immediately of medication. You should not think of medication first, because medications have side effects, and they take three to seven weeks to work, okay? And so on and so forth. And they don't always work, by the way. Did you know that? I think these psychiatrists will be honest to know that the statistics show, okay, that antidepressants on efficacy rates is closer to 60%. That means 30 to 40% of patients do not get help from antidepressants and so on. Our medications are not as effective as we think. Psychiatrists won't tell you that because they always give you medications. And they have all these side effects and they don't get better. Okay? But sometimes you need them. Don't get me wrong. But they're not as powerful as you think. You know what is very powerful? 
And of course, with severe depression, it's not enough. You might need an antidepressant or shock treatment sometimes and other things, okay? It's exercise. Exercise has been found the last few years, especially since the pandemic, to be even more effective than group therapy. Talk, 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 you tick talk, you know? But you walk, 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 oh, good. Walk, you know? I walk 12 to 15,000 steps a day, all right? When I'm on the phone, I walk, you know? Get up off your behind and walk more. Huh? And, 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 and that will help you tremendously. And a few other things. Not just walk, but walk outside if you can, in nature, and with sunshine. But Singapore is very hard because it's humid, okay? But you know, walk with, with, in, with greenery around you, shrubbery. You know, and Singapore, if I'm not mistaken, at the airport, you have Jewel huh, or something like that. <laughs> huh? Huh? And then you have some, uh, there's another place around here, the bot botanical gardens, or whatever gardens, right? You have greenery inside, and it's air-conditioned, right? Is that right? Ah, go and walk. Walk in the mall, free air condition. <laughs> you know? And then what else? With a sense of awe. A-W-E. That research has begun in the last few years. When you have a sense of awe, wow, this universe is big. You walk at night when it's cooler, you see the stars, you see the moon, you know? Wow. You see the beauty of God's creation, you see? Huh? That helps you a lot. It releases encephalins, endorphins in your bloodstream. These are God's natural antidepressants and tranquilizers that you don't have to take medications. And you see no side effects, you see? Exercise, one of the best treatments for depression and anxiety disorders. I always, almost, always prescribe this for my patients, besides all the other psychological things I do. And sometimes I refer them to psychiatrists for medication if need be. Are you with me? Not only exercise, sleep, crucial. Huh? It used to be said seven to nine hours of sleep, but now they found out the latest research about seven hours is the minimum, not eight, okay? But, but let's not go further down below that. Seven to eight hours of sleep a night. It rests your brain. It restores your, your, your brain. It gives your brain a chance to get rid of toxins in the brain, neurobiologically. Sleep is crucial. That's why you need to have sleep hygiene and to learn from the cognitive behavior therapies, sleep uh, uh, techniques. Insomnia control techniques. I told you, right, just now, a few of those techniques, okay? And then um, nutrition. Crucial. You're what you eat, okay? Therapy by nutrition. Hmm? That you eat properly, that you eat well, you know, and that you take the supplements that can be helpful, particularly omega-3 fatty acids, okay, or fish oil supplements. They've been found to stabilize mood some and to enhance your, your, your immune system and to be anti-inflammatory. All those things are important. Those are physical interventions not psychological, and not medical, okay? Are you with me? Huh? And then the medicine may help, the psychological things may help, okay? So again, to answer your question, you know, what kinds of steps you can take, I've given you some steps. Also, social support. Make sure you have a friend or two you can talk to who will listen to you, right? lay counseling or lay helping, you know, who can pray with you. And then if you really need to, no shame, no stigma, seek the help of a counselor. Talk to a professional who can help you more. Are you with me? Is that okay? Yeah. So prayer is important, but prayer sometimes is not enough. You might have to do all these other things, but God will help you. Okay. And the Holy Spirit is not against all these steps I've talked about. Okay. Back to you. Okay. As another question here. Some Christians are apprehensive about the visualization technique. What should Christian counselors be careful about when using visualization? Okay. Doesn't mention. Uh, doesn't explain. The context of the visualization technique is that in the uh, context of inner healing or uh, the relaxation? Or, I'm not sure. Any any one of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of psychological techniques use visualization. You're right. This is an old question. Many many years ago, I was asked this question. There is an assumption in this question, okay, that is problematic. I want you to listen for a minute here. The assumption under this question is that visualization, in and of itself. Visualization in and of itself is wrong. It's wrong to visualize. I want you to think about that for a moment. What's wrong with visualization? God made your brain, right? Your brain can think in words. Your brain can also think in pictures. That's all visualization is. You know? And, 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 and anyways, I don't want to get into the whole brain structure and all that, okay? You have capacities in the brain for certain functioning. You can think in words, you can think in pictures. Some of you actually think in pictures better than in words. And some of you are more verbal, you think in words better than in pictures. Visualization is thinking in pictures, that's all. What's sinful about that? 
what you're talking about is to visualize in ways that are wrong. That means you're using visualization for the wrong purpose, right? For example, when you visualize pornographic pictures, right? When you last after, right? When you strip people naked, right? And you do all kinds of things with them in visual. It's not the visualization that's wrong. It's how you use the visualization. So the question is wrong. The question is not, what's wrong? How, how, do we have to be careful of visualization? You have to be careful of the wrong kinds of visualization, you see? So when I ask you to visualize a beautiful sunset lying on the beach in Hawaii, what's so sinful about that? Huh? Most of you will say, hallelujah, man. Cheaper than going to Hawaii. <laughs> I just, <laughs> wow, I cannot go to Hawaii. I can bring Hawaii to me. <laughs> wow, just visualize Hawaii. They're very helpful, right? But of course, you know, Asians will tell me, ah, yeah, not Hawaii, la, Phuket Island, <laughs> or Bali, or something else, right? Nothing wrong with visualizing those things that help you to relax and sleep better. So visualization for, with those kinds of images is good. So also in a healing prayer, you go back to the past, you visualize what happened in the past, you know, how you were beaten up or neglected, and so it's painful. But using visualization to remember, to re-process re, uh, the pain, and then to see Jesus coming into the picture, okay? And, and, and helping you. Now, here is where people get stumbled with inner healing prayer. It's the visualization of Jesus, you see. You know, pe people often say in the healing prayer, now I want you to, you know, close your eyes, go back, imagine your father hitting you or your father forgetting your birthday and you're really hurt. And now I want you to see Jesus. Can you see Jesus? Oh, I don't know, maybe a picture of Jesus. Yeah, I see some kind of Jesus. Okay, can you see Jesus? Now I want you to see Jesus coming to you, holding you, embracing you, saying I love you, okay? To me, that is bad inner healing prayer. I'm sorry. First of all, how do you know what Jesus looks like? Right? Whenever you ask someone to visualize Jesus, right? You're usually asking them to visualize a picture or a painting of Jesus they saw somewhere in the museum, <laughs> in a book somewhere, right? No one of us has seen Jesus. We don't know exactly what Jesus looks like. So when I tell people, I don't ask them to visualize Jesus. That's the problem that some people have with this inner healing prayer. But that's not my, my way, the seven steps. I say, now I'm going to pray for Jesus to come to you in whatever way he wants to. Through the words of a song, through scripture, a touch, the Holy Spirit will do it. I don't tell them how Jesus will come. I don't tell them Jesus is hugging you. The Jesus hug you and say, I love you is a very Western white concept, you know. I have Chinese people when I say, can you, can you, can you sense, can you sense, not see, can you sense Jesus with you? Yeah, I don't know what he looks like, but I sense Jesus with me. What is Jesus doing to you right now? He's putting out a picnic basket, putting out a blanket, you know, like Psalm 23 comes to my mind, my, my, my client might say, you know, and I'm lying on green pastures beside the still waters, and Jesus is having lunch with me because nobody takes the time to have lunch with me. I'm a busy mother. I have three children. I have a big child, my husband. <laughs> every, every day I have to make lunch for four people and they rush off to school and I'm all left alone. Nobody has time to have lunch with me. I feel very isolated, very taken for granted, very alone. But now you ask me to pray, Xiang Yang. I pray and I see Jesus. Oh, I sense Jesus. I cannot see his face. I don't know what he looks like. I'm not visualizing him, but I sense his presence with me. And he's having lunch with me. And he comforts me because that's how important I am to Jesus. Then in the initial time when I did this inner healing prayer many years ago, I write about this case in my book, okay? It's not a case. It's a friend I prayed for. It's not a patient anyways. But she's given me permission to share this, okay? For over the years, I've shared it over and over and over again. So when I saw her 10 years later, I said, you know, when we prayed, she said, oh yeah, that powerful prayer really changed my life. I said, thank you. What kind of lunch did Jesus have with you? Huh? I forgot to ask you. <laughs> Was it noodles? <laughs> Was it rice? Was it a sandwich? She said, I don't remember, but I think it's a sandwich. Ah, yeah. Culturally sensitive, uh, Jesus should have had noodles or rice with you, right? But he had a sandwich. So I pushed it further. I said, Lap Chong sandwich. Uh. <laughs> she said, I don't remember. Doesn't matter about the sandwich or the noodles or the rice, right? What is culturally sensitive to this lady is that Jesus having lunch with her touched her more than Jesus hugging her and saying, I love you. I never thought of that. I didn't visualize that. I didn't tell her to visualize that. The Holy Spirit gave her that picture. So when the Spirit of God gives you pictures that are healing, praise God. Nothing wrong with that kind of visualization. But don't force visualization on people. Does that help? I went to a lot of detail there. So I've clarified visualization. Relax about re visualization, you see. But be a little careful. Okay, next. Is hypnotherapy suitable for Christians? 
Okay, now we get into hypnosis and hypnotherapy. Many of us have a, have a um, stereotype version of hypnosis, right? You've seen TV shows, right? sleepy. I'll count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's all on TV, okay? Drama shows. The systematic research shows that you cannot really be hypnotized if you're not having a high hypnotizability capacity. In other words, if you don't want to be hypnotized, you cannot be. If you refuse to be hypnotized, nobody has a power to hypnotize you. So don't give too much power to the hypnotist, okay? But if you have a high, what do you call suggestibility scale, you are just very open to people's suggestions, which is what hypnosis is, very powerful suggestions, okay? And, and, and some words to you. It's basically akin to deep relaxation. Then you can be hypnotized in quotes. Now, hypnosis is basically just an altered state of consciousness where you're deeply relaxed. And you must allow it to happen. Using a, a scientific approach to hypno hypnosis or hypnotherapy, and it's an empirically supported treatment, okay? There's research shown, uh, done, and, sh and research has shown that hypnosis works for pain control, for example, and sometimes for smoking control, okay? So, you know, they, they do hypnosis, they get you into deep relaxation, and then after you're deeply relaxed, you know, your pain becomes a little better. You can do the same thing with relaxation techniques without hypnosis. In hypnosis, you're supposed to go into a trance state. In relaxation, no trance state. But actually, social psychologists and other clinical psychologists have found that the so-called trance state it's a bit of a role play kind of situation. They're not in a real trance, okay? So I'm not going to go to all the controversies. Point number one, a hypnotist doesn't have as much power over you as you think. Point number two, hypnosis as a therapy can be helpful for certain conditions, but usually it's done in a very, very helpful way, okay? Point number three, okay, do you have to be careful of hypnosis? Yes, in the hands of a wrong person, they might hypnotize you to do wrong things, okay? So you want to be careful of that. Number four, should Christians then use hypnosis? You know, I think that for a scientific use of hypnosis, you can be open. If it's a Christian therapist, Christian hypnotherapist, then you pray for the spirit to guide you in the process of hypnosis. Huh? Otherwise, it can be potentially dangerous. So for me, I got some training in hypnotherapy. I don't use it because it stumbles Christians too much. I just don't. I just do simple relaxation techniques. They help them to relax deeply without a trance state without inducting them into a trance state. You follow? Why get into all that trouble for, right? So just do simple, direct relaxation techniques. That's my take on this whole thing. Is that okay? Huh? That fair? All right. I suppose it can be uh, dangerous in wrong hands. Uh, That's right. Hypno yep. Hypnotherapy. Yep. Yep. I think we have uh, time for just one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you have a question, brother? Okay. So during a recent uh, this uh, uh, healing and deliverance ministry uh, to to the Zoom, uh, this one uh, this uh, counselee uh, manifested and the face totally distorted. Yeah. I know he was demonized, and we tried to use the name of Jesus to cast out for almost a half an hour. Nothing happened until his tongue stick up until exceptionally long. Then I asked him, "What did you see?" Then he see he two a uh, white, one white and one black. Then I really, because I'm a Chinese there, so I remember there's a deity called Hei Bai Wu Chang. So the moment we call on his name and pray and cast out, and he manifests, I can see all the things all throughout. So I'm not too sure whether uh, when we cast out demons, do we need to know exactly the name of the demon? I yeah. just want to know. I already told you my view. You don't. Okay, so in that situation, it might have helped. But you cannot generalize from one case to all the cases. If you, you have to look at the Bible, you see. The Bible and not your experience, all right? What does the Bible say? What, what, you look at the Gospels, okay? You look at the book of Acts. Almost every instant, except the one with legion, Jesus never asked for the name. He didn't cast out the name. He just said, go, you know? And then this one, William Barclay, the old New Testament scholar, was the one who pointed it out, okay? <laughs> Jesus was asking for the name of the person, not of the demon. Say, hey, buddy, what's your name? Nobody ever treated him as a person. Jesus was very healing. He loved the person, not the, the case, not the pathology. He says, what's your name? And the guy said, my name is Legion. I have many demons in me. That's his name, not the demon's name. 
And Jesus says, get out. Okay? He didn't have to cast out legion. He didn't say in the name of Jesus, leave legion. He didn't say that. He just says, no, in the name, not in the name of Jesus. He is Jesus, right? Go. You know, and then they went. Okay? So I don't believe that we should spend enormous amounts of time trying to identify demons and their names and so on. You spend the rest of your life just casting out demons. If you do that, you know what happens, right? The demons have deceived you. You're wasting all the energy with demons. How about lifting up the name of Jesus? How about loving other people? How about helping them grow in Christ, you see? So we have to be very careful. Satan will love to get you stuck, okay? Spend hours fasting and so on until you get the name. Because if you don't get the name, you cannot cast it out, okay? I will give you a different answer. If I cast the demon out and nothing happens, I just wrap it up and say, in the name of Jesus, I shut this down and I walk away. Okay? Because demons will continue to make you pay attention to them. And then the other thing, I, I don't want to get too much into this, okay? Hysterical personality disorder. Okay? We have a, a, a condition in psychology, you know, where people have a very uh, a disturbed uh, kind of personality disorder that requires and demands attention all the time. Okay? Right? So sometimes they show demonic stuff to get attention. One time I went to a church, my old church. My pastor told me he spent hours and hours trying to cast out these, these demons, get their names and all that, and nothing happened. He was tired out. No time to prepare his sermon. No time to visit people, right? Satan's got him stuck, you see. He's laughing his head off, deceived. Okay? So I came. I was a former senior pastor. He talked to me. I said, you know what? I sense that there's more than demonic stuff here. There probably is some. This might be a hysterical personality disorder wanting attention. So when you say, in the name of Jesus, I shut you down and you walk away. <laughs> let him shout and let him manifest. Walk away. Do not do bad behavioral psychology by reinforcing them, talking to them again, paying them attention. Just walk away and ignore them. That's called in behavioral psychology extinction. Okay? And guess what happened? After an hour or half an hour, the guy shut up. No attention, ma. You walk away. And you go home and prepare your sermon. Forget about trying to cast out this demon. You understand what I'm saying? So don't let the demonic have too much hold of you. A lot of the demonic is deception. What is Satan called? The father of lies, you see. So you must be able to discern that. I'm not afraid of those demons. Okay, honestly. And I'll probably be attacked tonight because of this, but never mind. I don't, I'm not afraid of Satan. I'm not. You know, my God is much bigger. Hallelujah. And then His blood covers me. So rejoice in that. I, I know your example. People give me the example all the time. Oh, but until this happened, until that happened. Maybe, maybe not. It just happened that way there. Okay? I can give you many other examples where I never knew the, the name. Okay? And we were able to cast it out. And other examples where we knew the name and cast out and cast out and still go on and on and on. What's the point? What kind of game are we playing with Satan? Don't. Don't give him that much attention. Okay, so that is how I would cut off the thing. All right? Yeah. Hey, All right. You can't Hands cut out one. a personality disorder either. Yeah, sometimes right? there's a personality disorder. You, you can't cast it out. Oh. Yeah, you cannot. Personality disorder, you cannot cast out. <laughs> You'll start to get attention from other ways, okay? They need uh, prolonged therapy, okay? <laughs> and that's the other thing I'll say. Sometimes in deliverance ministries, one shortcut, okay? We think, pew, cast out a demon, they will be healed. They don't need medication. They don't need long-term therapy. They don't know. Even after you cast out demon, you still need follow-up. Yeah, you, you still need discipleship. Yeah. You might still need medication, yeah. right? Yeah. So anyways, don't look for shortcuts. Huh? Just trust the Lord more. I hope that helps, okay? All right. Back That's to certainly you. very helpful, Dr. <clears throat> Tan. And thank you very much for this very interesting afternoon. It's been very stimulating. You talked about the uh, role of the Holy Spirit in counseling, in uh, deliverance, in the psychotherapy. We've talked about the role of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and how He draws alongside of us, how He encourages us. And uh, we really need the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without the Holy Spirit, we are powerless as Christians. So thank God for His Holy Spirit. We've heard many questions this afternoon. It's unfortunate we can't address every question, um, but I'm sure uh, FGB will hold other seminars and talks <laughs> where we can... Uh, address some of these questions. Some of these questions are actually psychiatric questions, medication-related questions, which uh, if uh, Georgie asked me to come back again, I'll be very pleased, uh, very honoured to be able to address some of the other questions which are uh, related more to psychiatry and medications. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Father, we want to thank you for this very enlightening 
very stimulating and very blessed afternoon. We thank you for Dr. Tan. We thank you for all the uh, spiritual truths that he has imparted to us this afternoon. We thank you for his ministry. We ask you, Lord, to continue to use him mightily, empower him, fill him with your Holy Spirit, refresh him, we pray, for his next assignment. And Father, we pray that you continue to use him mightily in the days to come, that you enlarge his capacity to serve the body of Christ. We thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for the participants here on site and online, the many who have tuned in on Zoom. We pray that this uh, session this afternoon would have blessed them tremendously. So Lord, we as we depart, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Amen.